Hi, this is Tim Winters today, and we're going to present, uh, Broadband Forum is presenting Delivery on the Promise of a Connected Home. We have uh, several panelists here, and today we're going to talk about um, some of the events going on in the home networking space. I'm going to let each panelist introduce themselves today. Um, Hello, my name is Bahadir Danshik. Uh, uh, I'm product manager in, in Nokia and doing the standardization for uh, TR69 and, and USB. Uh, my name is Jason Walls. I am the uh, Director of Technical Marketing at QA Cafe. We're the makers of the uh, CD router test platform for connected devices. And uh, I'm also um, the co-director of the Broadband User Services Work Area at the Forum, and that's the group that's building Tier 69 and, uh, and USP in the data models. Excellent. I'm Michael Shaw. I'm with Axeros. We're part of Axeros GmbH, uh, based in Munich, Germany, longtime members of the Broadband Forum. Happy to be here. Um, Tim Spetz. I uh, work for Greenway Systems, uh, Senior Standards and Ar Standards Architect. Um, I also am the uh, USP Project Lead. So for the next part, we're gonna let Jason talk a little bit about USP for those unfamiliar with the technology and how it works. Uh, yeah, so, so for those of you who don't know what USP is or haven't heard of it before, it's really the evolution of TR69 into um, a whole new set of devices. Um, be that managed Wi-Fi or smart home devices or IoT. And uh, that really came about from uh, the need for service providers to be able to take control of the connected home. Um, and to, you know, with, with a number of things that tier 69 could do, but didn't do necessarily well enough um, when it comes to monitoring or ma mass telemetry um, or being uh, appropriate for smaller devices. Uh, so we sort of ripped things open and built um, a new protocol that is still backwards compatible with the device two data model, sort of make for an easy transition for service providers. Um, but it also opens the um, it opens things up for a new ecosystem where uh, multiple controllers can exist, um, and those can be that that can enable the end user to have a better experience and be able to control things in their home, um, either on the go or within their own network. Um, it also enables uh, third-party applications to be able to be installed on devices and um, kind of build those relationships with providers who are looking to monetize the connected home and uh, also improve on the existing use cases of Tier 69 with your traditional ACS. Awesome, thank you, Jason. That was a, a good high level of explanation of what USP is. So um, for the next couple of questions, we have some generic questions that we're gonna let everybody answer. And then for the format, you know, if you want to start queuing up questions, those in the audience asking us uh, individual Q&A questions, we'll take the back half of the webinar to try to answer as many of those as we can get to. So the first question I want to ask everybody, and I'll start with you, Tim, um, is why is the evolution of TR69 important? Um, I like to call it revolution. I, I don't think evolution, as far as TR69, is a big enough word. Uh, we, as Jason explained, it, before it was just uh, service provider management basically, of uh, remote devices. The big use case was we need to get firmware to devices, right? So it was more out of necessity, but what we've done is we've completely opened it up. So I think the other keyword that Jason uses is applications, right? So that, from, from my vantage point, now I'm opening in devices up to applications, which TR69 was never engineered to do. Um, so that, and by doing that as well, they're always on communication. Uh, TO69, as maybe the audience knows, it had a, a more rigorous uh, way to attach and to communicate, where this is more of an always on, always accessible environment. So if I wanna go into my home and turn my lights on and off, I can do it, I can use USB. Yeah, one of the reasons that uh, USP is important as uh, an evolution of TR69 is that, um, for its utility um, and ability to, to utilize multiple controllers. Mm -hmm. In the business of managing devices, the information that, that are produced from interface with them, it opens up an, uh, an unlimited amount of very user-specific, uh, user-case-specific applications. And in providing uh, network operators the ability to solve problems, and operators to provide services based on a technology that will extend a protocol into the capability to deliver services, it is uh, very practical. And um, be 
because it is going to be a standard, it is something that everybody can uh, utilize to develop uh, unique platforms, but also for operators to develop very specific uh, applications. So it's a very important evolution. Jason, uh, for for me, it was it was it was time. You know, we started uh, several years ago. We sort we sort of sat back and said, well, you know, there are things that TR sixty nine can't do, or we're not well suited for, sure. and people were trying to do them anyway. Um, so we said, it's time to kind of pull the hood open and look at the engine and see what it is that we can do. And when we did that, we set some very specific goals, and those goals were that it would be able to be installed on more kinds of devices, uh, things with fewer resources, um, that it would be backwards compatible with the device two data model so that all of that work that's already been done, because that's really part of the power of TR69, is that all of the work that's been done with the data model like, is, is, is really a standardized way to talk to all of these things and to map the whole network in the way that it, it needs to be described. And we've done all that work in Wi-Fi uh, with, with all sorts of interfaces, IPv6, IPv4, um, setting up firewalls, all that stuff had already been modeled and deployed out there. And we wanted to make it easy for people who are going to make that transition to just, you know, do it without having to change everything on the back end. So for us, it, it was time. And once we set those goals, um, we had a very clear picture of where we're going to go with it. So it, it was a very natural evolution. Yeah. So, um, Actually, like TR69 was born like 15 years back, right? So, yeah. and, and then there was really some, some needs for that, and then it was really addressing those needs. And then over time, actually, it, 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 it evolves, it improves. So, there are lots of other things added, like device two model, uh, you know, addressing different use cases and, and, and so on. But, but like, like, as the like all the uh, software, actually, there was also kind of an evolution needed here because uh, also TR69 has some, uh, some, some shortcomings, also, like, mm -hmm. like it. You know, like uh, especially like like very being very heavy on on communication, not not always on like a connection request problems. Especially like de deploying TR69, uh, especially on on the on the LAN areas and, and so on. There were there are there already some some issues actually. You know, being so such a chatty protocol, very being heavy and and so on. And then people were also I think I believe like like looking for some some other alternatives and and so on. So I believe. Um, uh, USB targets all these issues and and then and then um, and then address all those issues. And another thing also is that like for the TR69, I believe TR69 was never built for IoT in in mind. You know, mm -hmm. like and, and with the with the with the newer like uh, IoT trend now, with the, especially with the smart home and, and so on. So there was really a, a need for the protocol to 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 evolve and, and then really address those those needs as well and and i believe usp does this correctly now hey thanks guys um mike i'm gonna start with you for this next question and it is uh what are some of the pain points for service providers that usp helps sure solve? no it's a uh, us uh, usp addresses a lot of the problems that are that are important for uh, operators to overcome on an operational point of view so, for instance, the, the collection of mass telemetry and the analysis of data that's coming in from the network, which has expanded within the home to be quite complex, um, provides them the ability to troubleshoot a lot of things that they didn't have visibility and very good control of in the past. The other thing that it does is it allows them to um, make customer care applications very specific for different groups within an organization that might have responsibilities for, for uh, different uh, things going on inside the home network. So that's one of the, the critical factors. The other thing is that it um, provides a very wide range of ability for innovation. And um, so the problems that it solves also leads to a lot of new tech based on this standard that can be um, used for practical purposes in uh, self-care, uh, self-care apps that can be offered to uh, customers yeah. of an operator um, and as you pointed out it offers a lot of opportunities to create consumer devices and enterprise devices that become internet uh, of things hubs and so it's uh, it solves a lot of problems and it also offers a lot of opportunities Jason. Uh, yeah no I, I, I would say that um, the, the app enabled stuff is probably the biggest pain point um, mm -hmm in a way that they don't necessarily know. Uh, there's 
when it comes to say Wi-Fi management, there are many, many, many people trying to solve that problem yeah. right now, right? Yeah. And so, as a result, you know, you're getting you're getting everybody having sort of their secret sauce and how to do it, but, and that's fine. Um, but when we're building the standardized solution for it, we said, okay, well. We're going to build the standard. There's going to be a way to do it, but we want to have a way that this entire infrastructure can start to work together. Mm -hmm. So, the ability to install third-party apps and manage them, yeah. um, and have those things that are described in the data model um, get, you know, get revealed by a USP agent, even though it's actually a third-party app that's kind of doing all that work, um, is probably one of the major things that USP can do that solves that immediate pain that that service providers have, are having. Wi-Fi is the biggest one, um, but it's it's like Mike was saying, it's just self-care apps um, and all those sorts of things that they need to make sure that the end user experience is, is that they can offer a better end user experience as, as an upsell or as a differentiator, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so actually, in addition to Mike and, and, and Jason, actually, um, like, we, we do see that there is kind of a shift on, on the market, or especially on the service provider side, more, more on the smart home, you know, like, and then, mm. and then, and, 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 and TR69, like, like I mentioned, like has some, 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 uh, some shortcomings there to address those. And then, uh, and then that's why, why, why USB is, is becoming important. And then we, we believe that this will, uh, address those issues, especially with the smart home and then with this, uh, connected home and, and other, uh, uh, uh devices, smart devices at home. So that's why it's so important for us. Yeah, I, I can perfectly build on all three of what they just said. It's new revenue stream, right? Now I have, I'm doing a better job of the maintenance and then what I'm responsible for today, but now I have a way to move forward with new revenue streams. I have a smart home. Now I can have smart home apps that I can offer the customer that they can manage their own smart home. So it's all of what they said, plus something brand new. And this is something that the operators, I think are the webinars like this help them to understand because I don't know if they see that right away. I mean, they're a lot of times focused on what does TR69 do for me? What, what are my current problems, right? right? But this isn't a problem. This is a solution to new things, a new yep. avenue, new streams. Yep. And that's what we want to open our eyes up to. Yeah, and, and, and retail too. So like right. you have all these devices that are coming in that drop them in. you know that, that you'll if if they're implementing USB, they'll be able to drop into the service providers network and everything be called, be controlled in right. the same way. Yep. Especially when providers are getting blamed for the problems. <laughs> yeah, why not <laughs> jump on in? Nice. Um, the next question I have is uh, Jason. I'm going to start with you this time. Um, why is your company interested in uh, implementing USB? Why are you why are you talking about that? Today? Well, so we're we're in kind of a unique perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Because yeah. we're a test equipment company, yeah. um, but we've always tried to be on the forefront of innovation when it comes to these things. We really believe in helping standardization and uh, building yeah. better networks. And we think that helps you know, kind of build a better, better right. world. Um, so for us, well, we got involved early on to make sure that we were uh, building everything that was necessary to allow people to, uh, to um, develop their solutions um, in real time and go through the entire test process and make sure that everything is hardened so that it would be extremely likely that when they go and try to interact with the third party, they're going to be interoperable. Um, so uh, from our perspective, it's because it's a cutting edge technology. We've had so much experience with tr 69 um, CD router is basically the de facto standard test tool for it. Um, and so we, for us, we wanted to get in early on and make sure that we were in a position to make sure that the protocol was successful. Yeah, uh, for, for us, like, like uh, for, for Nokia, actually, Nokia is, is, is doing a device management. So we do we do yeah. we do have software for the device management, and then we have like more than maybe fifteen years of experience here. It is this this not uh, this does not uh, include TR sixty nine, but other protocols as well. Sure. Even 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 mobile device management, IoT uh, protocols, including TR sixty nine and and so on. So we have a very large customer base and, and so on. So we did in the, in the past lots of innovations as well, also for the TR69. Uh, very, very different use cases have been addressed very, in a very innovative way and, and so on. So, and, and we believe that, that USB would be the next thing after, after TR69. And, 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 and as, as being a leader in the, in the device management uh, area, actually, we wanted to continue this. And, and we already uh, started implementing uh, the, uh, USB, so we have already the, the stack implemented. So, and then we have already put them all in, in, in roadmap so that it will be 
part of our uh, device management uh, portfolio. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I just I would say back on uh, services and applications. <clears throat> Mostly, I mean, we're we're initial focus in the smart home, um, Wi-Fi management stuff like that, to where yeah. you can bring applications to the end user, new revenue streams, and that. So that's our focus. Yeah, uh, good question, Timothy. So as far as Axeros is concerned, um, we've always been a technology-driven company, and our participation in the plug fest, we've been to all three uh, for USP and a, and a sponsor of the the, the advance in technology. We have uh, representatives uh, working at this plug fest from North America, South America, uh, our headquarters in Munich and other locations in Europe. And so, you know, we, we like to say we're made in Germany, but we're made in Germany for global application. And, and why we're interested in, in participating on our ongoing efforts with Broadband Forum mm -hmm. is because the, the environment that's been created here for the development of the standard um, finding practical use cases that address real world problems for operators um, has been very productive. We've got manufacturers involved, we've got software technology companies like Axeros, uh, we've got operators involved. So it's a standard that has been created for the real world, for real world problems, but it creates a very wide palette for very innovative solutions to be implemented. Yeah. So that's that's how we think it's, it's this is a very good way to organize advancing technology that has a practical use in the real world. So we're very happy to be part of this. Awesome. Um, I have one more question for the team. Before I do that, people on the webinar, please um, go to the Q&A section if you have a question you want to ask. After this, we're going to open it up to the floor and uh, we'll start taking some of your questions. So please fill them out. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, we got you all here this week because there's a plug fest going on. Why don't you guys talk about um, why you're here, why a plug fest matters, and then be what you're getting out of it. Yeah. So actually, so in the, this is the third plug fest actually. So yeah. we have we have been uh, all, all uh, this plug fest actually, and 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 so far actually it was it was quite uh, beneficial for us. So uh, like like we were testing with with, with the device vendor with, with even uh, even the device managers. Uh, so we we can, we can able to test. We have like agent software. We have uh, controller software. So we can we can we can test uh, our implementation with each other. Like so far, like. Especially on, on the first two plug fest, I believe we have also like like you know I'm also working on the standardization side, so we have found also some some issues on the, yeah. on the standardization where there are there were some gray areas or, or yeah. specs were maybe not not very clear or there were some issues or that people have different understanding yeah. and so on. I, I believe in the first couple of uh, first two plug fest, those issues were, were addressed already. That also helped uh, driving the, the the standardization. Plus, also for us, it was it was really beneficial that we have very clear understanding on, on the standards, and then we could have uh, better our, our implementation. Also, in in this plug fest, so we were even like identifying some issues with, with different people, and then and then addressing those things. So it was it was quite beneficial actually. Um, so both from implementation perspective, from from standardization perspective. Great. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll I. I don't think I was at much of the TR69 plug facts, but there it was an ACS and a device, right? But if you notice here, most everybody's got an agent and a controller, yeah. Yeah. right? Right. So it, it's it's a different atmosphere now. Everybody's in the game on both sides. It's it's uh, you're realizing that it's not just some you know monolith thing sitting up in the service <laughs> provider that's running cooperation. It's multiple endpoints, and you need to understand both endpoints. To be able to you know get in this game so to speak so I, I think it's a it's a new dynamic and it's it's pretty exciting yeah and for for those of you who who, who don't have our benefit of knowing what's going on in the other room there's there's desks uh, full of uh, folks working on computer testing code against uh, their uh, competitors and come some places yeah. in the mm -hmm. in the commercial marketplace but this is a place where it, people are chasing good tech Right. So as as innovators, all of our companies want to create great tech. What's great about the Plug Fest is the University of New Hampshire um, uh, inter interoperation, interoperability. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and Broadband Forum create the environment for that to take place. And, and the reason that's important is because it lets everybody set aside the commercial concerns for a moment and, and create great technology. Yeah. That's what I think is very unique about the Plug Fest. And I think it's the right way to go about it. So that's one reason we're involved. Yeah, no, it's been very cool being involved this early. We, we started the plug fests early, 
right? I yeah. think the first one we did was before the spec was even yeah, the spec released, was the right? And we actually took a different approach to releasing the specification this time from the way that the broadband form usually does stuff. Yeah. Um, it's first of all, it's published online, which in, yeah. in, in, in web format, <laughs> which is yeah. makes me happy. But uh, we, we published it while it was still a draft, so people could already start to look at it. And so we were able to start doing the plug fests before, you know, to work out the details of things that weren't clear, like Bahadur was saying. Um, we, we got that out of, out of the way pretty early yeah, on. It's and, <laughs> right. And, and even now, there's, there's things that we don't necessarily have to change in the spec, but it's like, oh, well, you know, this sort of thing needs some clarification. clarification yeah. um, and that's extraordinarily helpful to making sure that things succeed. And what's awesome about it is it kind of puts it in contrast and cooperation with open source projects, right? Yeah. So you have you have a standard that everybody's building stuff to, um, but they're all looking at it separately. And that, in in a weird way, that actually gives people more eyeballs on it, such that we we find those gray areas, right? Um, so for it's 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 been really great. And I was thinking about the timeline. So um, I was involved with starting the original tier sixty nine plug fests, and back then. Um, you know, we found a lot of issues early on and I'm starting to see the USP timeline sort of follow that same pattern. Um, cause you know, the tier 69 plug fest didn't start until they were already, it, the spec was already two years old, two and a half years old. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it, it's cool to see that process sort of happening in real time. Yeah. yeah. All right. Awesome. So, um, we do definitely have some questions queued up. So, um, I'm going to start with, this is a, a good one that I really like. Um, when do you think we'll see this hitting the ground and being adopted in the real world? Anybody want to take that? I'll, I'll take a, a crack. One of the things that's, um, so we've talked in terms of evolution of tier 69. Um, great technology is invisible, right? And one of the things that, that is going to be important with it, uh, gaining widespread acceptance of tier 369 or USP is that its introduction in the marketplace is gradual. So I don't see a seismic shift occurring. Te technology, because it's invisible and because we're providing a bridge from one to another, and, and they're not uncomplimentary, I think it, we'll start to see it in the marketplace very quickly. Um, you know, new technology that disrupts is good in some cases. Ours is really gonna be non-disruptive introduction of, of a expanded capability. And that's that's why I think it might not look like a a, a volcanic explosion. <laughs> right. Right. Um, not all going to happen at once. But but neither will there be fallout. There'll right. be there'll right. be the addition of a lot of services and and, right. and other benefits that we'll see gradually. Right, and in a way we purposefully designed it to be that way. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good good question. Anyone else want to? Yeah. Anyone else want to take a shot at that one? I, the only thing I would say is that the the thing that has been sobering for me. Um, in terms of participation during the broadband forum meetings is that we are seeing different kinds of people being interested in USB mm -hmm. that we never would have considered for anything else, right? So we're getting a lot of application vendors that are coming in. Sure. Um, well, either they're secure, you know, they've developed security applications or mass, mass telemetry, yeah. Wi-Fi management companies. And the fact that they're interested shows that, you know, this has a much wider audience that, so you're going to see sort of multiple phases. You're going to see um, depending on the use case, you're going to see providers who uh, want to migrate because um, because it enables more things. Um, you're going to see people who are using it to build um, build their solutions mm. that will end up integrating into the ecosystem. And so I think you're going to see it from like multiple angles. Wait, and it's it's tiered services, right? It's like all, all of a sudden, you know, I have a BHR or a router at home that does A, B, and C, but if I want to get to service X and Y. I'm probably going to have to upgrade that to a better router, and that is probably going to talk USB. Right. So the older, the older equipments, the older systems, they still exist. But as you start evolving more to services and offering more, that's where you'll start seeing the shift. Right. Right. And it's like we were talking about last night. Once you do that, once you have a USB platform on something, then you kind of have future-proofed yourself mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, right? Because right. you're going to be able to do a lot of more things later on. Right. Yeah, we do. We do see actually like like the service providers are, mm -hmm. are also uh, very much interested. Actually, whenever we, we we talk with the service provider, they are quite a bit of interest. So we are also expecting this to be very soon. Actually, yeah. that's why why like uh, in, in our uh, platforms we already started uh, uh, implementing this. 
uh, and, and then we'll, we'll, we'll support this. So service solution. providers are already seeing use cases. Yeah, there are, there are seeing use cases. They are seeing the benefits actually. And, 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 and uh, so they, they want to see that actually in action. So that's why we already started also implementing uh, stuff. Makes sense. Um, the next question is, if we've already implemented TR69 on our CPE already, how and is it necessary to transit to USB smoothly? I, I mean, just what I was just saying, right? Yeah. So if I have a router that has limited functionality and all I'm ever going to do is manage it via TR69 to do what limited things I need to do, I probably don't need to change. But if I have a router that has maybe a, a Z-Wave controller on there, maybe has um, more memory, more functionality capabilities, I'm probably going to want to switch over to USB because I'm going to want to take advantage of that. I may want to put some uh, applications around that so the end user can use and you know drive revenue. So I think that really it gets driven from what do you want to do with it. Yeah. And, and I'd just like to say, because I think that's a good question, you've done nothing wrong. <laughs> 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 you, you've done the right thing. TR69 is a good standard. Yeah. And, um, We're not replacing and, it. Yeah. yeah, and we don't see this as a zero-sum game. Mm -hmm. So, so USP's introduction in the marketplace doesn't obsolete TR69. Um, it, it does some other things, and it does some other things in a different way. Uh, the agent itself, replacing the TR69 stack, allows for the use of multiple controllers, and it allows for lots of different uh, applications, uh, literal applications utilizing the controller that is um, working with the agent. So you've done a very important thing in starting the process of, of managing that device. The USP is an option that you can add to uh, that device uh, for uh, additional features, but uh, we don't see this as a zero sum game. Yeah, and it, I want to hit home the, the important point that we specifically designed it uh, to use the same data model so that uh, the majority of the integration work that you need to do when deploying even tier 69 is having the hooks go into, uh, you know, into the device itself so that the data model actually controls the things that the device implements. Yeah. And if you've already done that work, yeah. you don't have to replicate that work with USP. And that's a very good point. It's very complimentary. In fact. Right. And, you know, what, another question we had was, you know, do we expect agents to have both? You know, do we expect both? Uh, it's, mm. it's, it's all, it's all based on deployment. I know, I, I know of some, I know of some providers that are going to try and transition that way, right? But but the good point there is that that's possible. Yeah, right. that, yeah. I think that's the, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Probably. I mean, for for uh, this may exist actually for for some period so, of time. Sure, there's going to be a transition period. Yeah, and then there's a kind of a transition period and then. Yes. Good questions. Yeah, you guys are doing really good with the questions. Please keep them coming. Um, would gateways with a USP agent provided through 181 or another data model be API methods to build a map radio resource controller, or is it left to the map controller mesh API? Uh, okay, so that that's a that's a data model question. Yep. Um, the first thing I'll say is that one of the things that we did in USP versus Tier 69 is make sure that we uh, made so made the message structure be as simple as possible, so that all of the innovation can happen in the data model. And what that allows us to do, so so when in, in tier 69, you have RPCs, you have remote procedure calls. Those are defined in, in the protocol. Um, in USP, all of the command-like things are defined in the data model um, through, uh, and, and notifications too, right, right. And, and eventing. Right. So that allows us to forever always have innovation be done in the data model. Yeah. Now, what we have been working on in the Wi-Fi management space mm -hmm. is uh, incorporating um, and, and working very closely with how uh, Wi-Fi data elements work, right, um, is incorporating that into another section of the data model that'll be released probably Q2, Q3. Um, it'll be in device 2.13, and that has an entire data model for multi-access point uh, Wi-Fi with steering and, and everything. Oh, great stuff. Yeah. Okay. And with the ability for agents to be controllers and multiple applications deriving therefrom, including Wi-Fi optimization, it, it does become a very powerful right. option. Oh yeah, right. So so because of the multiple controllers, you could have a you can have a third party that you have made an agreement with be the yeah. one who's doing the Wi-Fi management, mm -hmm. right? Uh, or even have a third party software that under the hood is doing service their own special yeah. stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Services. Yeah. yeah. So I think this is, this next question kind of follows on that line. Um, does USP have partitions so multiple service providers can share the same local network and manage devices using their own ACS privately? Hmm. 
Okay, well, it's multiple controllers, right? So, and, and I think, not, not to diminish what an ACS is or does, but with USP being, I could have 10 different servers from the same service provider that talks different, you know, maybe one service Wi-Fi server, maybe another service just the download server, right? So it, it kind of changes the way sure. you look at it's everything, right? Example. So sure, you could, you could have service provider A, B, and C all connecting into that gateway. And the thing we haven't talked about is um, access controls. Yeah. yeah, so we, we when you open it up, before it was just an ACS, so that's the, the, the box that controls everything you do. But now, if I have multiple controllers, you know, I may not want the service provider to turn my lights on and off, right? There, so there are, we made USP such that when you come in, you have a certain set of access to the data model. You may only be able to look at certain things, you may be able to actuate certain things, and you could easily divvy up whatever that service provider is interested in on that particular agent to say, yep, you can do anything you want here, but if this other controller comes in, he's not, he doesn't have access to it. So. Right. Yeah. yeah, so I think that's that's one of the biggest difference between TR69 and, and, and USP, right? So like back, uh, back in, the, in the TR69, remember, there, there was only one server or one kind of a controller, ACS server, but, but in USP, there can be any number of, of, right. of controllers working with the, with the same device. Like, like in it like that, there could be very different use cases, like, like Tim was also saying, for example, you can have your controller running on your smartphone, and then, and then oh, you sure. can, you can, and and USB allows you directly access from your smart home directly to your device at home without going to the cloud and then coming back. Yep. Like, like if you had used the R69, you had to go somehow to cloud service yeah. provider and then come to it, all the way back. So here, like if, if your smartphone, uh, the controller runs on your, on your smartphone, actually, you can directly talk with your devices. Uh, with your given permission, whatever you can do, like like turn one off lights or, or, or whatever other mm -hmm. things you want to do, you can do it directly actually. Right. Or or in other cases that like like with the different controllers is that a service provider can still manage the devices, but but, but I don't know for for analytic purposes, for example, there can be another kind of a, a, a controller which collects data from the right. devices from different channels and, and so on. So this is um, this is possible actually, and and probably we will see really like more and more controllers for one device. Actually. Yeah. Yep. Sounds like okay. Um, so this is a good question. It's got it's multiple questions inside of one, but I think this is one we should cover. Um, the question was, where can we go to find out? So places that we can point people who are on this webinar who need to find information. Um, the first one is uh, how to build, basically how to create a USP TR69. Where, where should someone trying to build one? Where should they start? Oh, uh, we should okay. definitely go to the spec. I mean, it's at USP.technology. Uh, it's very easy to find. Um, in addition to that, uh, there's a number of resources. We, the, the QA Cafe, we have some training resources available. Um, I, I would bring up the fact, so there was recently a press release from the Broadband Forum that an open source stack is going to be released. Um, that's a, a very, very narrow scoped open source project, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. the protocol stack itself. Um, you're gonna still have to do a lot of the work, um, sure. but that's gonna be uh, released pretty soon, probably in the next few weeks, um, three, to, three to four weeks. Um, so all those resources will exist and that's a, you know we we have it internally at the broadband forum right now and it's it's pretty well documented so that's a good place to start too but I would definitely just go to go to USP te dot technology the specification is there and the data models are there and that's that's most of what you need in order to okay. do it. I think that answers almost all of the other questions <laughs> it's a very good resource too for members and if you're not a member you can become a member of the broadband forum and Xeros will be licensing uh, agents and controllers as well. Um, this is an interesting one. Uh, could it be an idea to build a future plug fest around use cases and features, not only looking at specific interop aspects or standard workout? Um, I would say yes. Um, one of the things that I think we're going to have to do going forward uh, is, you know, really expand the, uh, the test, the plug fest test plan mm -hmm. and build it into exactly what they're saying. Right. Uh, so that the, and it will also invite different kinds of participants too. We already did it already with with with, with the with the lights already right. Yeah. <laughs> so we already have some some. Uh, uh, yeah, some use cases. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I did see some use cases this week. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. is what happens on, when you get all these kinds of use cases. Yeah. yeah, and then there was another use case actually that you can turn on of the switches and that's all. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, here's a good one. Uh, how do you see the coexistence or concurrence of multiple standards in the domain of the USP space? And how USP could fit in the big picture 
end-to-end -end services, resource and device management, the SSOSS stuff type stuff. Well, the existence of multiple standards is, is not a problem. The important thing, I think, is that there are standards. Um, that is the, 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 the critical factor that allows a lot of innovation without a great deal of technology risk um, on the part of the manufacturers and the service uh, providers. And on the solution side, uh, the software uh, providers. So the standard is, is in itself the most important thing that there are multiple ones just, just provides more colors to the, uh, the, the palette. Um, so I think if I understood the question, it, it, those, those are not incompatible. Um, the standards, uh, the existence of a standard that's well supported by broadband forum comprised of operators and uh, manufacturers is, is, a, is a positive thing. Well, and it's standards a big word, right? I mean, <laughs> USP uh, by design gives you access to standards like Zigbee, Z-Wave, Wi-Fi, all of that, right? It's now you're taking these technologies and you're bringing that, bringing access to applications, to service providers, to everything like that. So very complimentary in that sense. Mm -hmm. Also, also yeah, another thing with the, with the USB is that like maybe another uh, differentiator for the TR69 is that like also in, in USB there are also some some uh, northbound APIs also defined uh, mm -hmm. where, where the where the OSS BSS can able to talk with the, with the controller. So there will be kind of a standardized APIs now over over REST actually, yeah. where the OSS BSS can can also integrate with the, with, the, with the controller. Which was not there for TR69. Right. Which was yeah. yeah. And and Timothy. Uh, um, Jason brought up a very good point. Um, you know, the data model in, in, in the USP uh, standard is, is very important. Um, it's, it's a lot more sticky um, and, and utilitarian in that we can actually take other protocols and manage them very effectively uh, using a USP uh, ecosystem. Yeah. And so um, by combining the capabilities of a lot of specific standards that already have, uh, that are used in a wide population of devices already out in the world, USP could uh, be seen in some respects as a unifying uh, technology. Yeah. Sure. Um, so we've talked a little bit about IoT, which is very important uh, because it means a lot of things, but there are specific applications out there that use Zigbee or Z-Wave or other protocols. Mm -hmm. The data model is very flexible in USP, um, so it wouldn't be uh, out of bounds to think that uh, you could have a, a gateway uh, that's provisioned with TR3, uh, TR69 uh, with an agent uh, like uh, USP that also uh, manages devices with uh, IoT protocols. Right, which is and, what we're working on right now. Yeah, right. And, yeah. and so we've, we're kind of, we're adapting to the world around us. The world around us has a lot of protocols and a lot of standards. Um, we see this as, as, as an opportunity to kind of unify them. So if you're creating solutions for verticals, whether it's operational in nature or commercial in nature. Um, this is very effective. It's utilitarian. Right. Yeah. And, and we also built um, a better proxying mechanism mm -hmm. in, in USP. Mm -hmm. um, in the data model, you actually have a, a proxy device object. Um, okay. And that actually that can represent devices that don't talk USP, sure. but right. the data model can still represent the things that the thing behind it. Behind it. Um, and so you'll see, it, there, it makes it a very easy on, onboarding process for, for non-USP devices. It's like a Star Trek uh, universal translator. Which always translates to English. <laughs> <laughs> a follow-up question I thought that was good on top of this, because you guys talk a lot about the standard, is what is the advantage of uh, an open standard like this over proprietary? So let's talk about how this, something like USP, how that works. I, I have the evangelist answer. Do sure. you want to give the more practical? You said the word retail. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, give, I'll, give a, I'll give a practical one. As a service provider, it allows for a lot of flexibility in, in hardware procurement. Um, it, it also allows for, um, it allows for consistent uh, product, really. Um, mm -hmm. So if it's hardware or software, it provides a certain amount of protection against making a bad investment. Um, I yeah. think that's the most practical uh, result of having a standard, other than allowing all the innovation we were talking about. Right. I like to think of it as future, future proofing too. Mm -hmm. So even if, because there are so many, for, especially for these specific pain points around Wi-Fi management and, and, and smart home brand, like branding, right? So the provider is able to offer a service that, that looks like it's theirs, right? Um, there's 
a lot of solutions for that right now and everybody has their own thing that they're doing but that's not necessarily sustainable in the long run right. um, so if you're going to be implementing a standard solution then when it comes time that you want to either have more competition or more options yeah. then that's where you get there well and, and if you don't mind one more follow-up to that what it also does is it, it you know sometimes these standards um the ones that are that are that are used in enterprises like tr69 Mm -hmm. USP can be um, can be very useful among the consumer manufacturing market uh, and the enterprise market space. And so if it's used in both, not only does it provide more opportunity for um, in-home services and the ability to communicate with and control those devices, but also for the operator to have uh, the potential of third party manufacturers introducing uh, devices into their customer premise. Yep that they could manage um, should they choose to do so. So it's um, in, it, it's one of those technologies that preserves investment uh, for the people who are making capital investment in, in enterprise networks, uh, but it also allows for manufacturers to become part of those ecosystems mm -hmm. and everybody to be able to solve problems together. So it's, uh, it's powerful. Awesome. Um, definitely keep those questions coming. We have a little bit more time to take a couple more questions. Um, this one is, uh, I think, a nice one. Uh, where do you see the most critical aspect into the journey to USP for operate? Hmm. Transition's always tough. Mm -hmm. um, institutions are are, um, are are driven by factors of safety and good practice and results. Mm -hmm. um, everything that's that's good in the world is usually results based. Right, so the the the, the, the tide waters are, are going to come together where we have uh, the transition from one technology to another. USP does that in a non-disruptive way. Mm. So I don't think, like we talked about, there won't there won't be a, an event that'll be that'll have shock waves. Right. But um, the biggest thing will be to uh, have them convinced that the the risk factor is uh, is tolerable. Mm. And I'd suggest that because it's a standard supported by the industry, there's little risk. And the second is to understand, does it mean that I've made a bad decision in the past with, with investments I've made? And I think yeah. that answer is no. Yeah, it's opening new doors is what you're doing, right? Exactly. Yeah. Good questions. Oh, these questions have been really good. Um, this is an interesting one. How do you see USP integration with different abstraction layers? Like, uh, for example, the OpenSync platform, uh, RDK platform? Uh, well, well it, those are two different things. I'd yeah, say. I, uh, I would I would definitely think that it's very near on the high horizon that somebody would try to incorporate a USB agent into RDKB at least. Mm -hmm. um, not that I know that someone's definitely going to do it, but I know that the code exists out there to already do it. Right. If, if somebody's going to submit that. Um, the second question, um, as far as OpenSync goes, is. It's really, like we've been saying, USP is sort of a unifying factor. Um, so if somebody is looking to invest in something like OpenSync, um, it's something that you can still manage with USP as a third party application pretty easily. Right. Well, one other OpenSync question that I guess I'll, we'll deal with right now since they're asking it, um, and this is about the tech bits of how does USP compare to um, OpenSync, which promotes MQTT? Instead of other messaging protocols, uh, we we've the one thing that I keep bringing up when it comes to that is um, based on provider feedback. Uh, we're when designing USP, we we separated the layers very clearly. Yeah. So being able to add another message transport is easy, and so we're doing that right now. So in version one point one of USP, um, we're going to be adding MQTT as a transport um, for all those people. The feedback that we got was that. A lot of people had already invested in MQTT infrastructure, right? Right, yeah. and that people know the servers; they've yeah. already done all this. Sure, those right. are deployed out there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, it, honestly, what mm -hmm. is maybe a couple months of us talking about it before it's? Yeah, we drill down, down a lot too. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and also, also, you know, like that uh, uh, for the protocols, there are there are two aspects of the protocol. Right, one is the communication part, right. where you where you exchange messages. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, so this is this is in the in the in the in the USP clearly separated actually where we can use different communication mechanisms. So that's one part, and the second part is that the the data model actually. So I mean comparing MQTT with with, with USP probably is, is not a 
uh, right approach here because yeah. their USB contains also the data model where, oh, where yeah. in, in, in QTT you can exchange any, any data and so on. So it's just kind of exchanging messages and so on. Also in, in TR6, so in USB, we do use the, uh, we will support the MQTT in, in version 1.1. But again, data model is, is not there at all in, 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 in MQTT. So that's, the, that's right. like one of the biggest, uh, strongest area actually on, on USB as well. Right, USB puts the intelligence on MQTT. Right, Fine. exactly. Right. And, and even on OpenSync too, I mean, I know that they've, they've sort of specified a lot of data model-like things. Yep, I'm not as familiar um, with that through, uh, I think they're just doing it straight up in Google Protobufs. Oh, okay. um, but it's, you know, they're, they're basically their definitions that they've had before they open sourced it um, versus, you know, the, the USB data model has been constantly revised right. every six to nine months over the last 10 years and has yeah. been deployed for pretty long times. So. Um, this is a, a classic one that I think, you know, I knew this was coming. Can you talk about the security features of USB a bit? It's an important issue, which obviously, if you're talking about anything today, you're going to talk about the security of it. <laughs> what well, was it that when Barbara first started, we were like, we're not, we are not finishing this until it is completely locked down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So why don't you guys talk about what, 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 what things we have? Well, TLS is probably easiest to read, right? I mean, we pretty much just followed that. Um, as far as certificate-based mm -hmm. um, encryption and authentication, it's rooted in it. I mean, that's right in the middle. You can have... Uh, we have two levels of security, so you can have one level of security, which is the transport. So if most of your this, most of your controllers are just going to be uh, locked down in a certain transport. You can just use the transport security, the you know like a uh, web socket connection, you know yep. that or co-app connection. You can do that, and then on top of that, if you have a more distributed system, we did put in an end-to-end -end security architecture. So you you're effectively running an application layer. TLS from one end to another, and that could go through proxies. That could go through uh, like an MQTT broker, where you know you have two different legs before it's getting to the endpoint. So, mm -hmm. right. it's so if that way. central thing is compromised, you still won't be able to. You will not be able it. to, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then the other aspect of security is the access control stuff. Yeah, and the access control, right? So, right. and we so you use the authentication from, you know, when you when I talk to you, you give me your stick. Get oh, you're you know user right. X. This is what you have access to, so it's all integrated in that. Awesome. And and to a degree, I'll just add that that, that because a uh, controller can be very specific in its uh, in its target application, yeah. and um, multiple controllers uh, interact with an agent on a device, and the way that messages are negotiated, communication negotiated, it, it actually provides a, an additional layer of security just in the way that you can apply communications and control uh, to an embedded agent. So um, not only on the, on the physical layer and the messaging, but it provides a way to create uh, very specific access for very specific purposes, almost uh, creating a, more of a, a, a hardened uh, approach to security uh, for specific uses of the agent by the controllers. Yeah, I, I think I think the, the the second part where where Tim mentioned like the end to end security where yeah. we can do mm -hmm. the uh, security on, on the message uh, level, I think it's it's very important because because you know like it really provides end to end security where the intermediate node cannot even even uh, uh, see the messages. So the, I think that's that's one of the strongest part here as well actually. Besides the, the TLS level on, on the on the communication level, which yeah. you, you may not even need that if you, if you use probably the, the right. other level security, like message level security. I think that's one of the very strongest. Uh, uh, and it gives operators the flexibility to deploy whatever model that yeah. suits them. Whatever. Exactly. Um, all right, I think we have time for two more questions. Um, the first one is, I see a OB USB agent has recently been released. Uh, how will this simulate in, in innovation and in introduction of uh, so that that was what I was talking about. Yeah, earlier. I wanted to give you a chance to talk about, um, about that. that. So that that's that will that's the project's been started. Um, we have sort of the initial code drops that are in Broadband Forums code base. Yeah. Um, but that will be released on uh, on GitHub probably in the next few weeks. Awesome. Um, the advantage I really think, uh, and it's something that keeps coming up at Broadband Forum specifically, because we had sort of had, you have this whole wave of people who are like, open source, open source, mm -hmm. open, open source. Uh, mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't do open source without standardization, really, right? 
It's like if you do an open or I should say an open source solution is not a standard. No, it's not. Right. <laughs> um, and so the I think the advantage of having an an open source version of something. Well, a we probably should have done it for, for TR sixty nine ages ago. Yes, yeah, right, rather than having when I'm teaching students, do it. <laughs> one of their first questions when we get to TR sixty nine is like, where's the open source implementation? So I think this will really help. <laughs> they will just sprout out of the ground. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so the advantage is that you know, Problem Inform is, is is taking control of that, making sure that there's an open source platform. But that platform has been developed in accordance with the standard. We test it against the standard. Um, you know, when it comes to certification down the road and, and that sort of thing. Uh, so I think that that's kind of the best of both worlds. Awesome. Um, speaking of the broadband forum, um, do you think the, someone asked would the USB be demonstrated with the DVF Q2? This is a direct question. I mean, we could. <laughs> <laughs> we could bring the thing we did at the Broadband World Forum. Yeah, yeah. We, we had a, a demo at uh, Broadband World Forum okay. um, back in October cool. um, that showed a couple of features of it. But if anybody wants to ask us about it, we can. Yeah. It's probably, it'll be in Korea, so I don't know how many people want to bring stuff with them on those long flights. Yeah, it's a long flight. Make it. Yeah, <laughs> my life won't make it. Right? <laughs> okay, so um, thanks everyone for the questions. I know we didn't get to all of them. We have a couple still left over. Um, we've run out of time. We have a couple things we want to wrap up here. So, um, yeah, you know, I'm going to cover this last slide. So moving forward, you know, there's been three plug fests up till now. Jason, do you want to talk a little bit about it? Uh, yeah, no, we, so, so we've had three plug fests. Um, we're doing the third right now, um, and we're going to keep planning more of them. Um, I s expect that the next one will be in Q3. Um, we might try to ramp it up a little bit faster this time. We were doing kind of every six months, but I think we're going to try to do something a little bit faster this time. So we welcome everybody's participation in that. It's an extremely valuable experience if you've never done one before yeah. to work live with other engineers from other companies. Um, and then the uh, the... What we have going forward for testing is that we do intend on releasing the certification program through the broadband forum. Um, that's probably going to focus on uh, self-testing with certified results to make it really easy. Um, so you don't have to go through kind of this huge painful process in order to get your yeah. platform certified. That's a change from what happened in the past. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so that, uh, that will also be probably about Q3 this year. The test plan's already done. We just have to start putting the, the nuts and bolts together. <laughs> awesome. That well, was good to hear. It's always good to hear when the testing's going on with the standards. Sometimes if the two lag too much, it ends poorly for everyone. Yeah. So it's good to hear you guys <laughs> going on. Um, there's a couple of, the slide up now talks about some of the resources. I know we had that question. There's the links right there um, up on the webinar that you can click on. We'll give you access to um, a lot of the information in this guys. I want to thank all you guys. I learned a lot today. I'm hoping everybody um, on the webinar learned something today. Do you guys have any last things you guys want to no, thanks for having us, and thanks yep. to the university and to the uh, uh, broadband forum for putting all this together. Yep, yep. thank you. And uh, I would say get involved. Yeah, if you jump if in. you're interested in this, jump in. Yeah, we're, we're nice people. <laughs> <laughs> I always say it's the most fun you'll ever have in standards, which is not saying. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thanks everybody. Thanks. Thank you, Tim. Thanks.